Welcome to another episode of Adventures of Kramer. So on today's episode, I wanted to try and break down what is Starlink and kind of my experiences and just try and help bring something simple. I get asked this question quite a bit and just want to try and answer at least some of those common ones. I wanted to just try and help save you some time right now. This is what I'm going to give you. Just six key basic things. It's basically a new and improved version of satellite-based internet. If you've had satellite-based internet in the past, it is way better than that. So I, it's just so much dramatically better. I've had like HughesNet in the past. This is nothing like that. It is so much better. They're trying to help provide that high-speed rural access to places where you know what you just can't get it. Or when you try calling up the local local cable company and they're like, oh well, we can't go out there or they're like, oh, it's going to cost five, ten, twelve thousand dollars to be able to run a line like a mile over to your house in order to be able to get fiber network or something like that. The other big thing is it costs five hundred bucks up front. That is everything you need. You don't need to get anything else. With that five hundred bucks, you can have your dish, have everything else set up there, and you are ready to go connected on the internet super fast. You don't have to have a technician come out, nothing like that. All something super easy you can do on your own. It's unlimited data, um, no download, upload, no reducing your speeds. It's $99 a month. I'm seeing speeds anywhere from 50 to 150 megabits per second. I have seen some spikes upwards over 200. Not very often though, but usually you're gonna hit right at about the 100 megabits per second. Uploads anywhere from 10 to 15. I have been getting some higher uploads here recently. That is Starlink in a nutshell. Um, nice high speed internet. For low cost, I mean, this is what, like 10 times the speed for the exact same price as what I had been getting on a recent like point-to-point -point wireless that I'd had in the past, but just something to try and keep in mind. If that's what you were wanting. That's as simple. I'm going to go into more detail as kind of video goes along. So hopefully you stick it out, but otherwise I'm hoping this helps kind of answer some of your questions. So the main goal of Starlink and a lot of some of this information I'm pulling right off their website is that they, they want to be able to give high speed internet to rural areas. So they want to give internet to people that you can't get internet. You can't like, you don't have cell phone coverage, all kinds of things. Again, the cable companies, things like that. They're not even willing to be able to even run lines or anything like that to be able to try and give you the high speed internet. And even though you want it, they just won't do it. Well, Starlink, that's their goal. They've recently won some different grants for quite a bit of money, millions of dollars, in order to be able to help continue to keep providing this goal out there. And I've even seen some different articles talking about how another side goal on Starlink is that once they get this expanded enough, this is going to be another way to be able to help fundraise money towards SpaceX to continue their actual space program, which is also, I think, something that's really cool and awesome and definitely something... I'm more than happy to help back in behind there. Now, the biggest piece that's different about Starlink is the fact that their satellites are actually in what's considered a low Earth orbit. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily like low, it's still 342 or 550 kilometers away, so 342 miles. But what you have to keep in mind though is other traditional satellite-based internet like HughesNet, they're like, 22,000 miles away like it's super super far away on where it is you got thousands of kilometers away how far some of these different other satellites are actually at so because they're so much closer it's going to require a lot more different satellites and so far they've been approved for like 42,000 satellites it's going to take a while for them to get that many up there so for right now, they only have the, just like what I was saying, um, I think they're only like 850 to like 900. And then they have a f like 60 or so more that are up in space, but it takes a long time for them to be able to move because of how they use ion propulsion. And I'll be talking about that here in just a little bit later. They have been approved for over 42,000, whether or not they'll actually end up putting all 42,000 up into space. But that's just something to keep in mind. And 
how much. I mean, because they've had a massive amount of interest. I think once some other articles have been saying they they have well over 700,000 people have been signing up for Starlink just to be able to try and get access to this internet. One of the coolest pieces about Starlink and some of its actual is how actually compact it is. It's a lot of these flat panels on there and a lot of how it helps to actually like bend out. And because of this, they're able to fit so many more satellites onto a launch than traditional satellites. It weighs a considerable amount less than even just like the HughesNet, right? I searched up HughesNet's satellite, the Jupiter 2. It's 6,637 kilograms, yet a single satellite from Starlink weighs only 260 kilograms. Now, I know some other different uh, low Earth orbit type satellite companies, even theirs weigh upwards of like 360 to 400 kilograms. Um, so these flat panels really do help make a big difference in helping to minimize the space needed and in order to be able to help take and send up as many as they can on each launch. They end up using what are known as phase array antennas. And if you want to know more about those, um, definitely help check out online. The little bit that I found on like a quick, like Wikipedia article is that it is, it's able to handle a lot of data really fast. A computer helps to like readjust the signal like phased arrays were originally built way back in like the old, old school ones, World War II for like radar detection and stuff like that. But now these beams can constantly be moved to be able to adjust without having to like have the dishes physically move as fast or anything like that. But it makes it really nice to be able to set and handle a massive amount of data for a lot lower cost than a traditional like satellite type based system. They also only use one kind of length of solar panels off of like the one side helps to kind of minimize any type of extra stuff going on also helps to like make it easier on manufacturing everything because it's so much more uniform and everything and what's being done and also in turn helps to lower the cost because it is expensive. I keep hearing different um, people talking about how every single like satellite dish and like system that they Starlink ends up selling they're actually losing like $2,000 for each one. So they need to actually continue to keep you as a customer for at least a couple of years to be able to help pay back that money. And that's where you get some of the other companies that start requiring two year contracts. Whereas with Starlink, you don't. It is really cool to be able to help see that they're using ion propulsion. And they were one of the first companies to actually use the noble gas Krypton to be able to actually help that out. And so when you electrify that Krypton, how it happens is it starts to send out those small little particles. Now, if you think of an individual atom of Krypton and how small that is and sending out one little piece shooting off the other way, doesn't do a whole lot. But if you were to have thousands and millions of those being sent out in one direction, and if you're up in space where you don't have any of that resistance and you're able to set and push out, even though it might be only like the force of like, somebody breathing out like that just a little bit of a force and even though it's a 260 kilogram object it's still going to be able to cause an action and reaction piece happening even though you push in one direction it's going to cause it to go the other way kind of like a whole wally -E with the what was that cartoon and he was using the um fire extinguisher up in space kind of a thing that same type of idea there even though it's low, you have to think about this as like a very, very slow acceleration. Because instead of accelerating over like a five, 10 seconds, these things can set and accelerate over years to be able to set and keep going faster and faster and faster, which is really cool. So definitely don't be expecting a zero to 60 time going super fast like you would on a Tesla, but these ion propulsions can definitely hit a top speed much much faster than or much much higher than what any type of tesla because i mean obviously it's in space you can hit very very high speeds up there um and then eventually once it's actually done it's like useful life and i'm not sure exactly how long the um starlink satellites actually do last i know that the jupiter 2 whenever i was doing some research on that it only has a useful life of about 15 years so it'll be interesting to see how long starlink satellites end up lasting 
um, but eventually that propulsion will be able to be used and it'll actually burn up in the atmosphere over, I think it said it was like two years from another article that I was reading about. The other cool thing though, is it has this star tracker and I think of it as this like GPS version. Now I know GPS is global positioning, so like, but it's, it's not like the GPS you'd be using on like your cell phone to be able to try and go find some pizza place in order to be able to eat. But what it does help to do is it allows them to be able to precisely locate that satellite where it needs to be in order to be able to give the best internet connection for people down on Earth, which I think is also pretty neat at the same time, too. In addition to not only knowing specifically where that satellite is going to be, it also has the autonomous, so basically just like kind of computer built in automatically being controlled. If there's stuff going around, it's going to be able to help avoid it. And with recent estimates being anywhere from 500,000 to a million pieces of debris in space that any type of radar type stuff can actually even see because there's even smaller particles that are floating up there that they can't pick up because it's just too small. And some of them flying upwards of like 17,000 miles an hour. Um, yeah, it's good to be able to have it to where it can automatically move out of the way what it needs to. And it uses the Department of Defense's debris tracking system to be able to help make that possible. And the picture down below here is one from NASA that just kind of shows like a little bit of a glimpse and you can find some cool videos online that actually show well it's cool but then it's also depressing too because then there's some like estimated ones of like what's happened in 2030 to where there's so much debris surrounding earth that you can't even see earth kind of a piece now as they currently to be able to get these off into space they use falcon 9s and it is that's the main stable rocket that they've been using for SpaceX and they were able to launch off 60 at a time, which is really cool and it's fun to be able to watch those. Um, there has been some speculation though, if they're able to use the Starship uh, by SpaceX that they could get anywhere from 400 to 430 satellites in at a time um, to be able to help launch off, which would dramatically increase the amount going up there. And eventually I would imagine they get to it, but who knows if how everything gets to be released or whatever happens. But I mean, if they can launch something off into space. They can figure out how to launch off 400 of them or more at a time with one of the SpaceX starships. So, but I did also see that they're building upwards of 120 satellites a month, a month, which is really cool, but they're only launching about once a month. And I would imagine though, over time, that'll start to increase though. So enough of some of the tech stuff dealing with satellite. If you wanted to just know, what am I actually gonna get out of the kit? Well, here we go. So you're gonna get your actual dish, you're gonna get the tripod mount, you're gonna get a Wi-Fi router, and that router is the one that you see pictured in the left that I'm holding there. Um, nice and simple, not a bunch of flashy lights. You have one main light on there that helps to show whether or not it's connected, disconnected, or that there's some type of like an error thing happening. You get a 100 foot Cat 5e Ethernet cable. You get another Cat um, 5e cable that goes from the power supply to the router. The main 100 foot cable that goes to the dish is super well insulated. Has two of the ferromagnetic adapters to be able to help out with electro, like the EF frequency to help kind of minimize any type of interruptions. And you have the power supply, you have everything. It's a plug and play system. It's super easy. It's like picture based. You plug in the, the white cable goes into the white ports and the black cables go into the black ports on the power supply. Could make it any easier. Um, the app is super simple to be able to use. It's nice. There's not a lot you can access and adjust like you might normally with other stuff, but there, it is definitely still a great system to get started on. So you might be wondering, well, how in the world am I going to get this mounted on the house? That tripod one's not going to work for me. And I don't want to just leave it out on the driveway. Well, they do have multiple different options. They've been expanding them, which has been awesome. Currently, I'm using actually the Ridgeline roof mount because I have a wood shake roof. And I don't want to sit and drill through the wood on the roof to be able to help make that happen. It is not meant for high wind areas, but it works great. Um, all these are like nice, strong aluminum construction finish. The pipe adapter kit, though, does feel heavier to me. I have one of those. It is that feels like a heavier like steel. So on the volcano roof mount, 
that one is definitely one you're going to want to use if you have higher winds though but you will need to drill in but they do include a lot of things to be able to help seal off the area whenever you do drill into the actual house the pipe adapter kit works great that if you already have like an existing kind of j mount going up off your roof as long as it's not going to be blocking any type of like if it's too close to the side of the house you have to have that clear northern view in order to be able to make that happen and a lot of these i mean they're all free shipping so it's it works out great to be able to make that happen and there's even some people that have been like oh, well that ridgeline roof mount looks a lot like the the little wings that pop out on the the falcon 9 as it's getting to land to be able to help adjust it so it's flying back down which looks pretty cool Some of you might be thinking, okay, what's the catch? It can't just be this good. I mean, and for some people right now, you'd be like, well, Starlink sucks. Like, that's not good. Well, you just haven't experienced being out in a rural area where you don't have high-speed internet access. You don't have all these different other luxuries that you would get in a town. The nice part about Starlink, you don't have this long-term contract. You're not sucked into this, like, two-year program. It's a month-to-month -month thing. If you don't want it anymore, there's no cancellation fee. You just go onto the website, do cancel your term, you go throughout the rest of the month for whatever that was that was being used, and then that's it. It's done. They're not going to get charged anymore. You have a 30-day money-back guarantee whenever you first sign up. Within those first 30 days, you're not satisfied with it. Test that thing out as much as you can. You get refunded for 100% of the purchase price. If you try and refund it after that, though, they do only refund you like a portion of what it is. Um, and I'm not sure if they changed that recently, but that was what it was whenever I first signed up. I've seen no data limits. I have personally used well over 500 plus gigabytes a month, and I've gone upwards of a terabyte on the past couple months, and I haven't seen slowdowns. There is times whenever the satellites are like switching and disconnecting, and I know that they are moving satellites to be able to help make connections even more reliable. But it goes, and it goes for high speeds, and it just constantly keeps going and going, downloading video games. It has been amazing. The only thing that I would say is that it's just not available everywhere. They're not trying to provide this to places in town where people already have access to low cost, high speed internet. Or, and they're, just, they're limited because if they were to try and open this up to everybody, even though they only have a thousand satellites, it would cause the whole network to slow down for everybody, making it for a bad experience. And they're not wanting to do that. They're wanting to make it a good experience. So it does take time. And in other countries, other countries have to sit and try and get approved in order to be able to have this different type of like satellite. And it takes time for that to happen. If you're at the point where you're like, just take my money, I want it. I really want this right now, sign up for it. I'm always getting asked this question. How do I get this? I want this, Where? when can I get it? Well, the only thing I can tell you is just go to Starlink's website, starlink.com. Put your email address in there, put your service address of where you actually live, that physical street address. They do have something with a plus code and a city. I have no idea what a plus code is, but that's something if you understand what that means, then definitely, you must understand what that is and then wait for that coveted what i like to call the golden ticket or the beta invite email you'll get that in the email it is only good for so long though it's not just like oh hey you could get it back in like july and it's good for the next like four or five months nope it is only good for i think it's usually like a couple weeks so you have to be making sure to be checking your email and occasionally checking your spam folder just in case it went to the wrong spot that's my best advice that I could give you. If this is something you're truly interested in, I would definitely try going there to be able to help get signed up. I hope this has been of some use to you. Thanks for watching. Hit the like button for me. If you got other questions, please definitely help to put them down in the comments below. Otherwise, peace everybody.